Mr. Photographer, forget taking any picture of me when I'm talking. Because I need to concentrate and speak to my brethren. <laughs> um, I want to take a few minutes just to think through what happened to us today. We began with Dawn, who explained to us, please don't take any pictures with flash, um, because then I can't concentrate, sorry. Um, we began with Dawn, who explained to us that what really mattered to her was to be seen and to be cared for and to be identified as an individual who had potential, to recognize her disappointments, and her achievements. And then we moved on and we realized that collectively, the staff of Kids Company and its children have been able to create a community where children are cared for and cherished and that that community structure was producing positive results, not only for the children, but also for the staff, that the staff felt valued and cared for. And then we learned a little bit more about the types of trauma that children are enduring and the repercussions in relation to brain architecture, physiological outcomes, and also complexities and challenges of negotiating a life keeps hurling adversity at kids. And then we began asking ourselves the question, how can change happen? How do you make that change happen? Should we be disappointed? Should we feel powerless? Should we feel that we can't bring about that change? Who are we to turn to? Is it our governments? Is it ourselves? Where do we get the step change that is needed in order to honour these children with the care and the protection that they deserve. And I guess that is where I want to start by ending today. There was a lot of talk about whether what we've achieved at Kids Company is attributable to me as an individual. Unlike you, I use colourful toilet paper I'm no different, but I have something important that I learned very early on in my life, which is that as you go through your life, it is imperative to have powerful values, that values give us an infrastructure, that give us vision about what we could aspire to, the quality we can drive ourselves towards. And if you were asking what is the ingredient of leadership that I facilitate within Kids Company, it's a very simple one. I want my team and myself to love and care for our children, these children who turn to us for help, as I would for myself as my team would for their own kids. I don't want the children of Kids Company to receive anything less excellent than we would want to deliver to our own biological children. And that, in essence, is the political challenge. The political challenge is one in which political narrative publicly makes statements that aren't always authentic in to their own private homes and their own private lives. Behind closed doors, you ask those people and they will say to you that they prioritize love above all else. And in the absence of love, maybe they prioritize ambition because really their intention in being chosen as a figurehead or as a leader might ultimately be that through the process of admiration, they will access love. 
whatever the behavior of anyone out there, good or bad, it really is a discourse, a tension about the availability of love or the terror of losing it or the terror of never accessing it. If you know loving care and love to be the essence of any reparation, or as the biological evidence, the neurological evidence is demonstrating, in fact, even be the primary driver for the efficiencies of the brain and the biology. If you know love to be the essential ingredient, then how do you do love in the public space? How do you do it for children whose biological carers are unable to deliver that love at that point in their lives. And this is not about blaming the carer, because invariably, if a parent fails their child, it is because they don't have the resources to deliver the care they would like to to their child, whether those resources are emotional, or whether they're material, or a combination of the two. We've been very good at diagnosing, naming difficulties, and then criticizing when people don't arrive at a point of excellence. And because of that, many of our social care leaders and workers have been too ashamed to speak about the fact that the agencies that they're currently working in are at breaking point. And that brings me to where do I get my evidence from for the concern I have for the way our care structure is going. I get my evidence because the very leaders in social services, child mental health, education, statutory services are coming privately to me in my office and sharing their concerns. I had the head of a children's service say to me, Camilla, I'm sitting on a bucket of shit and by the grace of God, it hasn't blown in my face. What betrayal to put our workers in conditions where they're terrified of things going wrong, but they're equally terrified of telling the truth about how damaged the system they're working in is and they're terrified of standing up and speaking on behalf of these kids because they fear losing their jobs and their promotions. What have we done to our workers in this system? And when a worker is terrorized and depleted, then that worker doesn't have the resources to give the kind of care and love they would like to to the children who are turning to them. When a child arrives, at the social work department or at the child mental health department, yearning for care, hoping for reparation, and is greeted by a worker who fundamentally wishes that that child wasn't there asking for help because they feel they don't have the resources to give the kind of help they would like to. What happens is that the child seeking reparation is further humiliated by an agency who feels that they can't be transformative. So the structure we've got at the moment, within it there are extraordinarily competent workers and there are much good work being done. But fundamentally, the structure we've got at the moment in relation to child mental health and child protection and the addressing the needs of vulnerable children is not fit for purpose. And it is not fit for purpose because it is under-resourced, but also because it has a flawed clinical theoretical model. The flawed clinical uh, theoretical model is overdriven by diagnosis and by the need to label and by this notion that somehow there's a destination to arrive at. And we have to drive these children towards that final destination. The 
the truth is that children who are traumatized have a lifelong challenge. Their journey is turbulent, they have lots of ups and downs, and not only internally and psychologically, but also life keeps throwing adversity at them. So the most intelligent clinical model to adopt for this group is actually a secure base, somewhere safe, nurturing, solution-focused, and constantly available so that these children know that if the family home is a challenge, if the neighborhood is a challenge, that at least there can be an oasis of care and tranquility somewhere. Somewhere where human beings can make sense uh, with the child about the experiences they're having. A sort of compassionate companionship, a community that is at all times ready to receive that child and to deliver the kind of care that a mother or a father would give. If we do this, if we rise to this challenge, just to add an additional model to our current models of having these secure bases in deprived neighborhoods which children can access, where all the professionals are under one roof and everyone is working collectively and cohesively, where you don't open and close files on a child and you allow the child to determine how much help they need at a given time to come and go as they need, then we will be able to actually take an enormous pressure off social services, enormous pressure off child mental health, and give these kids the kind of security and sense of belonging that they're yearning for. And in that context, give them the capacity to imagine more positive futures. You know that. You've always known it. When you go home, you know what you want for the kids you care for. You would want what you want for your own children if you were prepared to admit it to yourselves. But then ask yourselves the question, why are we so servile as a care profession, as leaders of services, that we're unable to bring a 